Hi, welcome to the signal path. In this episode, we're going to try another repair. This is an HP 34420A, and Keysight still makes these instruments. These are nanovoltmeter microohmmeter units, very accurate, especially for making very small voltages. As a result, they can also measure very small resistances. They all have two channels, and the two channels in combination can be used to make four-wire measurements in the resistance mode. But because they have two independent channels, you could measure voltage on them separately. In fact, you can even subtract voltages from each other. They have different ranges because one of them is mostly used as a sense. You can see that the channel 2 can only go up to 12 volts, whereas channel 1 can do to 120 volts. Now the back end of all these instruments is the same. There's only one real digitized, there one reference, and it's shared between the two channels, so it has to switch between them. So right now I have it set to channel 1, and I have that connected here to the Fluke 754 documenting process calibrator. I'm applying 1.23456 volts to it, but as you can see I'm measuring nothing. So channel 1 is not responding at all, and that's in fact what was wrong with it. I've always wanted one of these, but they're quite expensive, even as a broken unit. I think this was almost $800, even when it wasn't working. But I think channel 2 works. So let's go ahead and switch that. So I disconnect channel 1 from here, and I just connect the other channel. All these wires are broken out separately. There we go. Now if you go to channel 2, you can, you can see that we are indeed measuring exactly the right voltage that is being applied here by the fluke. So hopefully this is not a very complicated problem, because as I said, the back end is shared between both of these. So there must be something in the front end that's gone wrong. Let's take a look inside. Now I forgot to mention that these things can give you seven digits. So I enable that by just simply seven digits. You can see how many more digits we have here. And if you look carefully, the last digit over there is brighter than the rest of them. And that's because most likely that digit has never been enabled. So the VFD has aged. I did buy a replacement VFD for these, and it has to arrive from China, because I thought it might be dim, but it's actually not that bad. Nonetheless, it's nice to see so many digits at the same time. And here is inside of the instrument, and thankfully because it's completely fanless, it's also really clean inside. And they have divided things in an interesting way. We do have the input filter and fuse section over here, and we have the long rod, which is the power switch, and the transformer is fully housed and fully isolated, which is also nice. Here's the back end where the ADC is implemented. Here's our reference for the entire unit. You can see there's only one section here shared between the two inputs, some custom HP parts under for sure. I think this should probably come off. There you go. And that's the cover to protect the front end. Now we'll take a closer look at it there because most likely that's where we have to start making our measurement. But here are the four cables coming in from the front connector. And there's some spark gaps and everything, protection circuitry and some beads in the front, which makes sense. And some cutouts in the board. And the ohms range is also here for the controllable current sources. I believe it's all under the same cover. This here would be the first FET amplifier base, and if this is dead, we are screwed, because this would be very difficult to replace, but luckily that's not the problem, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to make any measurements at all. So I think the problem is probably confined to the front. Let's take a look. And here's a closer look at the front end with the four wires coming in, so it should be pretty easy to trace those and see how they propagate through here. Now I suspect that these must be solid state switches that can reroute the signal. I'm not sure there are, there are four of them, we'll have to take a look at the schematic. Luckily the schematic of this is available, and there's some other relays scattered around. So let's set up something so we can do some debugging, but first we should probably take a look at the schematic. So here's the block diagram of this instrument, and this pretty much verifies what we were suspecting to be the issue with the unit 2. So here's the front end. This is the part where the input is switched between various functions, as well as choosing channel 1 and channel 2. You can see channel 1 and channel 2 marked over here. This switch function, along with these switching relays, are able to reroute the signals in such a way, such that the DC amplifier that follows the entire structure can actually measure the voltage. So given that we can measure voltage on channel 2, it's very likely that all of this stuff is fine. Certainly this part is working, otherwise we wouldn't be able to make any accurate measurement. I can't verify this yet, because in order to do this we would need to be in the ohms measurement and we would need the channel 1 to be working. But all this stuff here is boring stuff, digital things, but all of that must be obviously working, otherwise we couldn't have anything. So we should pay attention to this front end and see how that switch is being accomplished. And here's the schematic of the front end portion. So the wires enter this part of the circuit. So we have V in, V low, ohms low and ohms high, which will be the, I think are the channel 2. So if I follow this, you can see that the V in, for example, goes over here. There are spark gaps and other protection circuitry, which we did see when we looked inside. But if I follow this through some inductors, which we also saw, eventually we get to this component, which is a solid state optically controlled relay. And if that's not working, the signal cannot get across, and if it can't get across, we would not be able to measure VN. So this is certainly one possible suspect, and there's four of them. There's another one here, 
one here and one here and you can see that they also are part of the same switching so if I look at VL comes over here and then there's some additional paths that need to go through these relays now there's a lot more stuff going on around it but given that you know spark gaps and resistors and capacitors typically do not fail I suspect that these solid state relays may be part of the problem now I want to change them all at the same time if I have four of them because it's good to keep them unmatched anyway. So even without making any measurements, no harm in replacing these and see if it makes any difference. Now you would be right to say that it's also possible that the control circuitry of the relay isn't working. So if we don't switch this solid state relay, of course nothing's going to happen neither. There's some pull-up resistor over here and this NMOS transistor at the bottom has to be working alongside the rest of the circuitry in order to be able to switch them. So certainly that's worth checking too, but I'm not very patient. Let's go and replace these relays and if that doesn't work, then we'll really dig into making individual measurements on all these nodes. And here we are, all four of them have been replaced. They're actually quite easy to replace because they're all sitting on low thermal mass traces because they're all on the analog signal lines. And here's the four that I took out, quite simple to do. And they're actually surface mount, they look like they're through hole, but they're not. Let's give it a try. And check it out, intuition pays off and channel one is now working. I'm measuring five volts over here. We can enter a different value. Let's enter 2.354 for example, and let's see. There you go, look at that, it works, amazing. So let's switch it to the other channel, make sure that the other channel still works too, so we didn't undo anything else. Here is channel two now plugged in. If I go to the other channel, channel two, it works, incredible. So now that we know it is okay, we should measure some of the other characteristics like resistance and let's see how close it is to calibration. Let's put it on a more reliable source. So here we are, I have it actually connected to the Kronheit model 523. This has been warmed up and this has been warmed up. And you can see that it's measuring quite good. It's only 15.7 microvolt out. And this itself needs a little bit of calibration. So I think this may even be closer than what is shown over there. Let's try a different value. Let's say 1.234567 here. And in that sense, we should read almost the same offset in that voltage as well. There you go, look at that. So it's not that far off. I'd say pretty good considering that we worked on it. I have no, no idea when this last time was even calibrated. So let's see 10 volt on there for this. Let's see what it does on the 10 volt range. It should be also pretty close. Yeah, it is really nice. Very good. So let's try to do some resistor measurements. Now we're basically using all the terminals of the instrument at the same time because this is a four wire measurement. I'm measuring a zero ohm resistor, essentially a short. The connection in the front is not perfect, but nonetheless, we're only measuring 35 micro ohm. So we're pretty close to where we should be. So here at the bottom, I'm going to change the Fluke 5458. Let's try one ohm. And this is the actual value it's supposed to be. This was recently calibrated by Ilya from XDEV. So I'm pretty confident that it's going to be correct. Let's see what we get once it settles down. There you go. So it's measuring 0.999678. And this should be 0.999695. So I'd say that's damn close. So let's now try 10 ohm. And for the 10 ohm measurements, we have 10.001922. This is 00193. So again, pretty good. Pretty happy with this. So clearly, this instrument has maintained really good calibration as typically these HPs do maintain very good performance even over very long periods of time. And here's a result for 100 ohm, so 100.011 versus 100.012. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with this. Looks good. There you have it. I hope you enjoyed this really quick repair. I have a lot of stuff I need to get through. Sorry if this seems a little rushed, but I think it would be more interesting to go through all the repairs that are waiting to happen. See you in the comment section.